Everyone here? Cool. How's everyone doing today? Good? Good morning? Good morning. Uh, we're going to be talking here about the forgotten human threat. Um, first, I want to say thanks to Jailbreak and everyone here for this awesome, oh, for, sorry, for this awesome event. Uh, it's cool to see everyone. It's cool to see how far Jailbreak's come. Like, as, as a lot of you, I'm sure, have been here since the beginning, come to the brewery, have tasted the great beers. It's cool to see how, uh, how far they've come. Casey kind of ruined this for me. He just basically told you this whole slide. Um, but I'll kind of go through it. Yeah, I started in uh, government and military. It's kind of where I cut my security chops, uh, working like m probably everyone in this room over uh, in a fenced area across 32. Uh, did some really cool stuff over there, um, some offensive, defensive security, information warfare. Um, learned a ton. Kind of got sick of the big bureaucratic organization that is the government, so I left. And I went to Microsoft, which it turns out is also a big bureaucratic organization. <laughs> uh, but it was fun. I you know, did some software development. Uh, we, we were contracted to build some, some stuff for the, for the, for the government. Um, towards the end, did some incident response work. So Microsoft has customer-facing incident response team. Uh, so customer gets breached. We'd go out, four guys, and, and help them tackle it. Uh, most of the time, I was the reverse engineer on that team. Um, and then, left, like I said, left Microsoft. And now I'm at Carbon Black. Uh, technical architect there on the threat side. Been doing that for about three years. Um, here's information if you want to get in touch with me. I'm not a paid member of LinkedIn, so my LinkedIn name has that 02AB, whatever. But um, Carbon Black. How many people have heard of Carbon Black? Cool. That's about half the room, I think, is what I saw. How many people have used Carbon Black? Cool. 15, 16, something like that. Cool. So Carbon Black, I work for Carbon Black, and uh, my boss is also here, Scott Lundgren, he can raise his hand. He works for Carbon Black, he's the VP of Engineering for Carbon Black. What is Carbon Black? Well, we're a company that uh, deals with endpoint security, and we have three primary products. The first one is CB Protect, or CB Protection. Uh, this was created when the company first started, which was formerly Bit9, right? People have probably heard of that too, the company Bit9. Uh, about 13 years ago, guys got together and decided they wanted to uh, lock down the endpoint, so they came up with this default deny application whitelisting kind of idea. And that's one of our products, Carbon Black Protection. Another one is Carbon Black Response. Carbon Black Response was created about four years ago. Uh, and this is a product that is more on the incident response side. So let's collect all the data, continuously record it, and then go hunting and, and try to search for stuff. Uh, the last product that we added uh, last year is uh, CB Defense, and this was an acquisition of a company called Confer that their idea, their concept is a little bit more on the let's try to use behavioral prevention on the endpoint rather than um, like static, static signature based stuff. If you want to know more, we're here. This isn't a sales deck, right? I'm sure some of you guys thought, oh, wait, am I getting sold carbon black now? Uh, just wanted to kind of give you an overview of, 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 of what we do. Um, so we're around. So Carbon Black's vision, this is the last thing I'm pretty, well, Carbon Black's vision is to create a world safe from cyber attacks. That's a very ambitious, ambitious goal. It's probably not attainable, as I'm sure all of us in this room know. Uh, but it kind of defines what we try to do as a company. Um, why do we need to keep the world safe from cyber attacks? And my thing just, died. okay. Breaches are everywhere, right? We wake up in the morning, you turn on the news, you, uh, read the internet, and it's just this not endless stream of, of breaches that are occurring all over the world. And it seems to be happening more and more and more and more. It's funny because I can pull out like my, my phone, right? I wake up every morning and I, and I check the feeds and I say, okay, you know, what's happened today? And just this morning, let's see, what was it? Chipotle, I think, uh, had some kind of breach on their point of sale system. Um, it used to be a surprise, right? You'd hear about a breach and you'd, you'd think, oh, that's, that's interesting, and that's a big deal, and now you hear about them all the time, and it's, it's, not, it's not much of a surprise anymore. In fact, I think 60, it depends on whose stats you believe, but around 60% of companies believe that they're going to be breached in 2017. Like, they firmly think that that's just going to happen to them, and that's a pretty telling stat, right? Um, what are we trying to protect ourselves from? Right, they're cyber criminals. These are kind of the, the standard, you know, uh, dark net, selling ransomware, um, very financially motivated. 
the uh, th has anybody did anybody see the Krebs on security report about a recent cyber uh, or not sorry ransomware uh, kit basically that you can buy so you can go on there and they have an ad for it they have their own press ad for a ransomware kit that you can buy and and deploy it's it's pretty crazy um, hacktivists these are another group of, of, of the, the actors, right? Anonymous, those types. Um, they're kind of more just destructive and, tar and, and, and targeting specific ideals. And then there's nation states, right? These are the guys with unlimited money, unlimited resources, unlimited time. Yeah, it's gonna happen. You're gonna, you're gonna get hacked by these guys. There's nothing you can really do about it. Um, but there's one that we often forget, right? Uh, we, we spend so much time trying to prevent the cyber criminals, the hacktivists, the nation states, uh, so much effort, so much money, uh, but we, there's, there's one more that's gonna pop up in a minute that, that we often forget about. Does anybody, anybody have an idea what that might be? What was that? Insider threat. Insider threat. Aliens, I like the, alien, I like the aliens answer. Um, <laughs> insider threat. We often forget about them, right? But they're the ones that have the most access, right? They, they're already in your network. Um, we probably should be a, spend a little more time on, on the insiders. What percentage of attacks involved in insider threat? Any ideas, any, any guesses? 70, 10, 30? How many, think, how many people think it's above 50? Okay. 60%, this was an IBM report last year, 60% of all attacks that they looked at involve some sort of insider threat. That's pretty high, right? What is an insider threat? Um, those two words, kind of self-explanatory, it's a guy who's on the inside and is a threat. Um, but I think we need to dig in and, and figure out, if we're gonna try to stop it, and try to, try to d detect insider threat behavior, we need to kind of figure out more about what an insider threat actually is. No booze? I didn't hear any booze. I, I expected a lot of booze in this room from that. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is the, the most recent kind of, uh, you know, picture or, or, or portrait for what an insider threat is. Um, but I think it actually goes a little deeper. So I'm not gonna read all this, and you don't have to either. This is uh, CERT, SEI. Uh, they have an insider threat division, and they run through a lot of breaches and, and insider threat cases, and they do studies, and they put that together statistics and everything else. They came up with this as the definition of an insider threat. The really important part is intentionally exceeded or misused access. So they had access, and they intentionally misused it. As they went on and this, uh, analyzed more events, they realized that this wasn't a total definition and they had to add to it uh, because a lot of breaches involve unintentional insider threats, right? So through their action or inaction without malicious intent. So CERT is defined insider threat as both malicious and non-malicious, okay? Cool. So first we're gonna talk about the unintentional insider threat. How many people get, how many people get that picture? I knew a few would, yeah. IT crowd, it's the internet, yep, okay. <clears throat> accidents happen, accidents happen. So accidents do happen. Um, a lot of the uh, unintentional insider threat uh, cases involve um, accidents, accidents. And, and it's not always people that you think are on the inside. There was a case uh, last year with Google uh, where one of the uh, vendors that was handling Google's payroll system uh, accidentally sent a spreadsheet with a bunch of usernames, social security numbers, and everything else, to a different agency, not to Google. So Google had to go through and file a breach report and tell people that, that their stuff had been compromised, all that kind of stuff. But it's just accidental, right? And this is hard to protect against. How do you protect against accidental insider threat, right? It's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, another really common uh, non-malicious insider threat is phishing. Um, this is still the number one attack vector used in cybersecurity warfare, right? That it's still, phishing is far and above uh, the most common way that an attacker tries to get into a system. 
Um, and why is that? Well, uh, according to some recent reports, 40% uh, of users still open those emails, right? Still. Like, I think we've known not to open those emails for like 20 years, but people still open them. And out of that, 20% of those people who open them still click on the links. Like, uh, I don't know. It's users. Sometimes users just, yeah. Um, and it's getting more targeted. Phishing is, is it's, it used to be just this mass, let's throw out uh, as many emails, let's spam, and hopefully we get someone to open it. Now you're getting targeted emails that are, you know, kind of, hey, this is your, uh, your uh, home uh, mortgage company, right? It's an email that makes it look like it's your mortgage company. And so you're more inclined to open it because you're like, oh, well, I owe money to these guys and I don't want them to foreclose on my house, so I better open it. But uh, when it comes to phishing, a story that I like about targeted phishing that, uh, that I like is, uh, I'm going to get Scott to come up here and put him on the spot for a minute. Um, he used to work in, uh, do some red team work, and he's got a pretty cool real world targeted phishing story, at least I think. Thanks. So I'm Scott, Jeremiah and I work together. We happen to, at different times, have both lived in San Antonio, Texas. So we have a shared love of the Spurs, who won last night. And so while we were watching that game, he asked me to come up here and talk. So what I took that to mean was, hey, my presentation's coming up three or four minutes short. And so I need you to fill in the gap. So I'm here for that. So I know we all have our fishing stories, so I'm gonna try to give mine, but try to kind of like accentuate what Jeremiah's uh, saying here about the importance or the impact, the results that come from targeting. So maybe like a lot of you guys, um, you know, I got my start in this industry as a pen tester, probably about <laughs> getting older, right, 20 years ago. And uh, we were able to craft some, what well, we thought were pretty clever phishing emails. Uh, it was back in like 2002, and we'd send them out. Uh, this was against DOD installations. And we get maybe a 10% click through at that time, mostly because of technical difficulties. We had trouble just actually like completing the whole process. Uh, and this is really simple stuff, so this is no exploitation, it's literally like click to download kind of stuff, or send an XE in the attachment, so old school stuff. And we wanted to up that percentage, and we ended up stumbling, so I have no DOD background, I was a contractor, so um, I was a little bit of an outsider working inside the DOD, and so I looked at everyone who was active duty and kind of saw a different culture, and out of that I kind of was able to, as again, as an observer, to see some themes, and so, so there were some emotional hot buttons. And one of them was a reduction in force, right? A riff, right? The idea that, hey, you're in, you know, you're, you're, you're volunteering, right? You're giving yourself, giving service, and now maybe you're not wanted. And that was a very emotional topic. So I came up as the dumb 22 year old contractor with the idea of searching Google for a name, find a rank, target the email in two minutes to say, hey, at your base, we're considering reduction in force for this rank. You should definitely click this link, right? That whole thing took maybe two minutes per person. Participation rate went to 100%. <laughs> um, some really neat stuff about how quickly one can compromise all the domain controllers across the Air Force at that time, right? So 15 years ago, uh, using that technique. Uh, key point, though, I think the primary uh, kind of point of the story to make it a little bit funny was that resulted in me being taken aside <laughs> and told to knock it off on the bay. <laughs> on the basis that that was a little bit emotionally uh, difficult, obviously, as a recipient to you know, hear, hey, maybe that's the end of your job. So uh, that's the story, but again, the point, obviously, is pretty straightforward, right? Um, with a little bit of targeting, you can kind of appeal to the hot buttons of the individual target. It gets really difficult to resist that urge to click, um, and so I think you have to conclude that, hey, that's just how it is. So thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, I like Scott's example. It's, it's the perfect targeting example. Uh, I mean, I like the 100%. That's, that's a good result. I mean, a good result for you, for, for that exercise, not a good result for people clicking on stuff. Um, luckily, phishing is something, you know, we can kind of control, right? We have email filters. We have uh, oh, one of our products, uh, protection, um, default deny, right? They can't open it if it's not on the whitelist kind of things. But uh, uh, we can kind of help against phishing or work against phishing. Um, the real idea in the unintended insider threat case, or, uh, yeah, case is to uh, not make the attacker's job easier. Um, I mean, everyone thinks this is a joke, but I've seen it, right? People's passwords under computers. It's, right, it's crazy. Um, 
there, and then it's not just this, it's like, it's password hygiene in general, sharing, sharing passwords. Some people, you know, my, my boss needs to uh, do something with my access and I gotta run to lunch, so I'm gonna just give him my password because he's my boss, right? Whatever, things like that. Uh, but it turns out there was a case I saw in the, in the news a couple days ago um, where a guy got fired, um, left the company, then breached his company two weeks later because someone had given him their password for him to do some IT sports something, right? So, um, so don't, don't make the job easier, right? It's, 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 uh, it's already easy enough for attackers to, to find out a lot of information about you. Speaking of information about you, um, if we could do a little exercise here. I'd like everyone to put their hands up, like one hand up, okay? Who's on Facebook? Put your hand down. There went almost the whole crowd. Who's on Twitter? Put your hand down. If you still have your hand up, yeah. LinkedIn? One, two, three, four, five, six, if I'm not missing anybody. Okay, so six people in the room that are not on any of those. Are you on any of these? Oh, we lost one. We still got one though, two, okay. Um, we as a culture now, as you know, we're uh, the, I, the, the internet and everything else, we're, we like to share. We like to share information about ourselves and we like to read information about other people, right? And we overshare and we, it's kind of how we interact. We interact on the internet now. Instead of like sitting down and having a coffee with someone, we share stuff on the internet. Um, but what that leads to is, you know, who's seen this when you log into something, right? What's your... What's your, where did your mother and father meet? What's your uh, mother's maiden name? All these kind of security questions that are trying to keep someone from, that doesn't, shouldn't know information about you from accessing your accounts, right? Well, we put this kind of stuff on Facebook, right? So this is uh, Princess Leia um, saying she, she met, you know, Han Solo on the Death Star. Like, what kind of information can we gather from this? Well, we know she met him on the Death Star, so we can answer that question of where did you and your spouse meet, right? Um, mother's maiden name. Mother's maiden name is one of the things that we add, put on every financial form that we submit, everything, and it's, aside from your social security number, probably one of the most asked things about you. Um, Facebook. You can find that information on Facebook. Right? Um, evidently Chewbacca was a little sad. <laughs> but... And then it's not only what we put in our post, but we put, you know, we want to tell the world all about us and how cool we are and what, what colleges we went to and, and what degrees we have and uh, where we're from and, all, you know, our relationship status. It's, it's complicated. Um, how many friends we have, right? And, and all this stuff kind of goes back to the, what Scott was talking about, the targeting. If you can figure out information about people, which it's pretty easy to do these days for probably everyone but the six people who still their hands up, um, then you can, you can, you can uh, pretty easily you know, find ways to, to use them to your advantage if you're trying to, if you're trying to attack someone. Um, another kind of unintentional issue when it comes to uh, insider threat is bring, bring your own device, right? This isn't as much of a concern, I think, for most of the people in this room who kind of work in secure spaces and, and, and government organizations. Um, but in, in the commercial world, it's, it's getting pretty big. People want to bring their devices. They want to work on their devices, right? It's, and then on your device is your Facebook account, which has all this stuff. That, anyways, uh, unsecured, and, and it's, it's becoming a, a real challenge and, and a, real, a real problem uh, with that unintentional insider threat stuff. Simple things. How many people go to the airport without thinking, walk up, and plug your USB into that hole right there? Right? I've done it. You're in a hurry. I'm, my phone needs to be charged because I got to check Facebook. Right? <laughs> so you, pl you plug it in. No one sees a problem with that. I mean, everyone obviously sees a problem with that, right? But, um, <laughs> and that's Delta, so you can probably trust them, I think, maybe a little bit. At least they haven't thrown anybody off airplanes recently. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was actually something I saw about Delta yesterday. I can't remember what it was, but it, was, it wasn't as bad as American or United, but it was, you know, some, I fly Delta, so. Um, but how hard would it be to take a Raspberry Pi and make a little device and go sit it, you know, under, under the, the chairs where, where sometimes you walk in the airport and the little chargers are under the chairs as I'm getting on my plane and going to, to Boston or wherever I'm going 
And the people come, plug in, I gather all their information because they think it's a hot spot and they gotta, they gotta charge the phone, check Facebook. I come back, I land, I pick it up and I go. I can get all that there's stuff through security, it's not hard, right? So th this comes back to the whole don't make it easier. This is the unintentional side. We're making it way too easy uh, for the attacker. Um, now we'll start talking a little bit about the, uh, the more intentional insider threat, right? We saw the picture of Snowden. Everybody saw that, yeah, the more intentional side. These are guys that are motivated by a few things that kind of go into these buckets, right? Fraud, theft, sabotage, espionage, retribution. Um, these are the guys that you trusted that betrayed your trust intentionally. Let's go through a few examples, right? The, good, the big example, Snowden. Um, trusted, had access, had a lot of access, worked at a lot of different jobs. Um, People call this more of the idealistic insider threat, right? He didn't do it for damages, or so he says. Uh, but, um, but he did it for idealistic reasons. Um, the, the, the damage caused by, the, by this was, was immense, as everyone in this room knows. Um, it's pretty crazy, right? Um, this is another one that's recent, right? We don't know who it is, but but same kind of thing, you know, the Vault 7 stuff with the WikiLeaks. Um, another big one, right? So, so what we're seeing here is we're seeing that, that these, these intentional insider threats cause absolutely enormous damage to the company or the organization that they are uh, betraying. Another example is, this was a recent one. This is a cool story, so, well, not cool, but uh, this guy, uh, hacked into his own company while he was still working there and stole information because he thought he was going to lose his job if his company got acquired. So he was looking for the information about the acquisition and he did this for over a year. Um, still unclear why he, stole the inf why he stole stuff, but right, he had a motivation. His motivation was his job. I don't want to lose my job. Um, he wasn't really, you know, maliciously acting out against his company, meaning he wasn't like trying to get back at his company. Uh, but he used his access to, to, to try to find information that could help him. Uh, this was one in, back in 2009. People have probably heard about this one. This one was one that was caught, so the damage wasn't bad, but it could have caused a lot of damage. A uh, contractor got fired, decided to, uh, they told him he could stay for the day. So he, he got fired for writing a bad script or something like that. It was like some, who hasn't written a bad script, right? I don't know that was a fireable offense. Um, so he got fired for writing a bad script. <clears throat> they told him he could stay for the rest of the day. So he uh, wrote a cron job on the systems that on January 31st, 2009, or 2010, one of the two, um, it would basically decimate all the servers in Fannie Mae. This was found five days later by another engineer who was looking at some stuff on a server and found the cron job, and luckily it, it didn't happen, right? Um, but moral of the story there is, if you fire someone, don't let them keep working, right? It's, yeah, okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, this, <laughs> this is an interesting one too. Uh, a guy uh, in uh, UK border security, he had access to the no-fly list. His wife was out of the country. He didn't like his wife, so he put her on the no-fly list. Okay? She... For three years, she had to battle to try to get off the no-fly list. Uh, turned down, turned down, turned down. She was stuck in Pakistan. Um, the way this was discovered is even <laughs> funnier. He was up for promotion. And they said, um, okay, cool. We're going to run a little, another background check on you for this job. Why is your wife on the no-fly list? <laughs> so... Again, it's not always the big cases like Snowden, right? The ones that cause the massive damage, but people can use their access in nefarious ways. <clears throat> Why are the insiders so hard to catch and so hard to detect, right? They already have the access. You've already given them all the keys. Sometimes you give them too many keys, right? The privileged user case, the guy who has access to everything in the whole entire organization. Um, those, are, those are the bad ones. They already know the landscape. They know how everything's laid out. They know where the crown jewels are. They know uh, what network protocols you use. They know how to bypass, you know, 
proxies, filters, whatever you got, um, turn off AV. They know how to get out of your network, they know how to get into your network, all that kind of stuff. Um, they know the defenses, so they, they, know what you're, they know how you're trying to stop them. That gives them a leg up. They live off the land, right? So they're not, a lot of times they're not just installing and download, downloading and installing malware and running it once they're on the inside. They're living off tools that are already there. This report was from uh, the target breach. Everyone remember the target breach, right? Um, and it was a study that found that once, once the attackers were inside, um, they moved around just using the tools that were already uh, inside target, target's environment. They didn't need to up, upgrade, upload anything else. Um, and the biggest one is probably that it goes against our trusting instinct. We like to trust people. Um, I mean, if we're all putting that stuff on Facebook, then we are trusting a lot of people. Um, but we like to trust. We don't, we don't like to you know, hire someone or work with someone and say, well, I don't really like that guy and I should keep an eye on him. Right? It, it doesn't make for a good work environment. So what can we do? How can we uh, improve <clears throat> our ability to uh, detect insiders? It's, it's challenging because everyone's seen this, right? It's the, uh, um, it's the cyber kill chain, right? Everyone's seen it. So going from left to right, we, uh, this is kind of the different stages of how an attack works. You have to be able to kind of recon, get information about something, weaponize, create an exploit, create the tool that you want to use, deliver it, actually perform the exploit, and then you want to control and maintain your access and execute your, your mission and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> the, the idea behind this is that it's easier to catch people the further it is to the right. So it's easier to catch people reconning, right? As you start to get into exploitation and especially control, execute, and maintain, it becomes really hard to, to, uh, to, to catch and, and, and discover because people are already in your environment, they're already executing, they're already doing their job. If you didn't catch it by then, it's gonna become really hard to catch it after. Um, most, you know, again, stats are stats and you never know, but um, you hear things all the time, like once people are in your environment, it takes a year, six months, nine months before they're even detected that it happened, right? Um, so it becomes notoriously hard. So why is it hard to protect, why is it hard to, uh, to uh, find the insider threat guys? Because they're already past this point, right? They're already inside your network. A uh, guy at our company uh, has this quote that I really like, which is, all attackers are insiders once they gain execution in an environment, right? So once you're past that execution point, everyone's effectively an insider because they're inside your organization. So what can we do? Well, we gotta protect the important stuff, right? We gotta lock up our data. We gotta figure out what's important um, and, and what we need to protect. That whole privileged user thing where we have one person that has access to everything, that's probably not a good idea. Um, we need to continuously record, right? We need to pull all of our, all of our information, our audit logs, our, our logging, log in, log out events, our, um, all of our security events, all those things, put them together uh, and, and, and monitor and, and, and be able to uh, dig through that information uh, to try to find things. Look for the anomalies, right? What are people doing now that they didn't do before? Um, I love this picture, I don't know why. It's I don't know, something about stormtroopers with a, with a little glasses nose thing on. Um, but look for the anomalies. How can we, how can we find uh, what's different? Yeah, like I said, what's different now than it used to be? Um, Thinking about this when I was when I was putting this presentation together, um, I was looking at our products and I was like, "How could we better use one of our products, for for example, CB Response, uh, to to look for insider threats?" And so I put together a little demo um, that that I'm going to go through uh, real quick. So, actually, real quick, has anybody ever seen this? This is cool. I went to show it earlier and I forgot. Um, so this is uh, if you just do like a Google search for um, data, data breach bubble chart, this comes up. Uh, data breach bubble chart. It's by information is beautiful, uh, is, the, is the, the site, but they collect all this information about breaches and uh, categorize them and put them in a bubble chart, timelined on the, on the left going down. So latest on the top, uh, earliest on the bottom. And the size of the bubble is the number, or the impact of the breach, right? The number of, of records or whatever. Um, it's funny if you go back, so we'll go back to, I don't know, 
2004. Like I said, there's a few things here and there, here and there. Oh, here's some more. Yeah, but as you scroll up, it becomes, it starts to fill the entire, uh, the entire page. You can go on the site and like waste hours because if you, when you click, it tells you information about it and then you can click again and it tells you more information and then you click again to see like the, the, the actual news report. But anyways, just wanted to share that. It's pretty cool. I forgot that I had it up. So this is, uh, this is our carbon black response product for anybody who has used it or hasn't used it. Um, the basic idea behind carbon black response is we, uh, we're collecting all the information that happens on your endpoint. We're collecting all the processes that, that, that execute um, and then what they do, what network connections they make, what files they modify, what um, registry edits they make, um, any cross-process type events, you know, if they're trying to inject into other processes, any child processes that they, that they create and spawn. Um, and we store all this and do some, you know, add some, uh, um, some information along with it. But let's just see if I can, oops, it logged me out because it's been sitting here. So we can go in here and just enter a search like I'm going to look for calc.exe. Just to find out who's doing math in my environment because I don't trust people who do math. I mean, how can you trust guys that are good with numbers? Anyways, um, so you'll see that it brings up uh, information about you know, the, that process that I was looking for. Um, this is cool, right? We can, we, so in the insider threat case, we can dig in and we can say, well, you know, I have a starting point and I have some information, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go look. Um, but this doesn't really work from an anomaly detection point of view. The data's all there, it's just not in the right format. Well, luckily, Carbon Black, we, uh, we believe in open APIs and that the data is your data. So I can create my own system or my own little demo app that connects to this data and, and shows it in a different way, right? The same data, the idea behind it is I'm going to go over here to this little app that is listening to everything that comes into Carbon Black and looking for, so these are my, these are my five little dev machines that I have set up. And the idea here is I wanna be alerted every time that a new user logs into a new machine. So when that tuple of user and machine is new, I wanna know about it. Why is it interesting to me? Because if you're an insider threat, or even if you go to the case like pass the hash or something like that, people are trying to get access to machines, right? That's one of the use cases. So let's figure out when someone's trying to access machines for the first time, right? So Scott's job, since Scott has a job back there, his job is to log in to these different machines for the first time. Um, and as you can see on the right here, we have these recent new logins. Um, so two hours ago, Scott logged on to server 01 for the first time, right? But if I, if, this is obviously a demo, but, but if I, uh, you could build something around this that would, that, would, that would give you information about when users are accessing, what they're doing, what was the last thing they executed, all that kind of stuff, oh, there we go. So Scott just logged into uh, some guy's PC, right? That might be something that we wanna look at, that might not, I don't know. Um, but if another one comes up here in a minute, the real question is why is Scott like suddenly logging into every machine on the, uh, in, the, in, in my little network? Going too slow, Scott. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I think everyone gets the idea, right? That, that uh, through, through the data that we, that, that we can all collect as organizations, we can use that data in interesting ways to, to try to find those anomalies. And then just to kind of finish off the demo, another really cool part of Carbon Black. So let's say I, I, I realize that Scott's logging into all these machines and, and, and I, wanna, I wanna get some more information. Well, our product has this feature called uh, Live Response. So what, is, what was the last machine let's say that I got a notification for? Some guy's PC. So I'm gonna go to see my sensors, some guy's PC. This is called Live Response, and I'm gonna click it in a minute, but first I'm gonna give you the, the, the details of where it came from. We had a requirement that we, uh, people wanted to be able to reach back into boxes. So you give us a lot of cool information, but I wanna see more. I wanna be able to uh, go in and, and maybe execute some commands or do something like that. So you take a couple guys who are ex-intelligence agency offensive guys, and you give them that requirement, and they come up with a remote access Trojan. So basically, Live Response is a shell back into the server that the endpoint is running on, right? And 
this is all live, right? PS, I can run a process list, I can upload files, I can download files. See, I can see what Scott Lundgren is doing a little bit. He's, yeah, processes, he's, well, those are all his user processes. But if he had calc running, I would be really suspect because I don't like, yeah. Um, the power of this is pretty cool because then you, I can upload, if I have put, get, all that kind of stuff, I can upload files, I can run my own files, right? It's, it's, it's a really powerful tool. Um, and it also helps you be able to dig in and find more information if you have kind of a lead on, on insider threats. Um, with that, let me see. With that, the actual presentation is concluded. Um, I'm more than willing to answer questions or you guys can get drinks or whatever or I'll be around or whatever people want, so thank you very much. <laughs>